Um, so I'm super excited to talk to all of you today um, to sort of reintroduce myself. Uh, my name is Ann Nichols. I work at Team here in Salt Lake, formerly Event Board. Uh, when I'm not breaking code, I am a wife, mom, cat owner, writer, and cosplayer, because you gotta have a hobby. Uh, I have been really interested lately in writing and researching, uh, it, building communication and collaboration across tech teams. And uh, part of that has been that working in QA and working with all of the different departments that are on a tech team, I tend to see the same issues again and again and again. And so we're going to start with an all too common scenario. Uh, you're sitting at your desk and you've got your headphones on and you're deep into a project. And uh, you know, you've got lines of code in front of you and you're sending very clear signals. Please do not disturb me. I'm working. I'm trying to get things done. And uh, sure enough, you get a tap on your shoulder. Um, and you've got to break that concentration, put your headphones down. And the question you get asked is something along the lines of, hey, you know that thing that you're working on? When is it going to be done? Uh, and uh, you have to then answer their questions, sigh, put your headphones back on, and try to figure out where you just were and what you were just working on and picking up that train of thought again. And that can get really frustrating. Uh, and there are things like this that happen so frequently across tech teams, and they seem like such little things, but they cause so many issues over time. And that's why I was really excited um, about the theme for this year's DevOps Days. This is an excerpt from that theme. Uh, Tools are always easy, humans are complex, and it is the human which works with other teams to collaborate, gather, and validate the requirements for the pipeline. Uh, regardless of the tools that we're using or the products we're building, it's the humans that have to learn how to collaborate and communicate in order to get things done. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this over the last few months, um, about this idea that we're all in this together. It's very easy to feel like we're siloed in our individual departments with our individual workloads, and we tend to forget that we're part of a hive of people who are all trying to reach the same goals but have very different work to do. Um, and so let's talk about some of those issues. Um, the first is uh, the pressured manager versus the overworked engineer. So maybe you have a manager that comes to you and says, hey, we have this really big project. We have to get it done right now. Uh, they're under a lot of pressure, and uh, they won't listen to excuses about why that's not realistic or feasible to get it done. Uh, they feel panicked. Maybe they have pressure from uh, executives or from board members or from customers who are threatening to pull a contract if something doesn't get completed. Uh, on the other side of that, you have an engineer that maybe is already overworked. They already have a lot on their plates, and they don't understand why priority keeps changing. Uh, and they feel misunderstood. They're left out of the loop. They don't understand uh, why certain things are taking precedence and why things keep shifting. And uh, in this scenario, neither party has sympathy for the other one. Um, the manager is not going to feel a whole lot of sympathy for the engineer when they have so much pressure to get stuff done. And the engineer has no sympathy for the manager who seems to keep changing their mind or pivoting direction. Um, another scenario is, uh, the best way I could think of it was the thrower and the catcher. Um, this is the person that constantly throws things over the fence before they're completely finished. Um, they have a specific job to do, and they have to finish their piece of the puzzle before it gets passed on to the next person in line. And uh, they feel too much pressure to get things done too quickly, and so they sort of uh, half throw it together and then chuck it over the fence. Um, and maybe they trust that, hey, the, that next guy, he'll, he'll figure it out, he'll pick up the slack. Uh, they feel rushed and maybe also are getting pressure from executives or managers to get things completed. Uh, on the other side of that is the catcher or the fumbler sometimes, um, the person who has to pick up the slack 
um, make some interpretations or assumptions uh, that maybe they shouldn't have to make. And uh, they receive little direction or feedback as far as what something should look like or how it should function. And they can also inadvertently then be the thrower again and um, sort of half complete something or not well define it and then that gets passed on to the next person in line. Um, and they are frustrated um, and maybe feel like they are siloed and unsupported. And once again, uh, neither one of these people have sympathy for each other. Um, everyone's just, you know, trying to, so hard to get things done quickly and rush things out the door um, that there's just, there's no sympathy for the person who's tossing it over the fence and there's no sympathy for the person who's catching all of that work. Um, one more, uh, the messenger and the shooter. Um, Usually the messenger is maybe in middle management and they receive direction from an executive level or a VP level that's, hey, there's this new tool that we have to use or new security requirements we have to put in place. And the messenger's job is to basically direct that to their teams and to guide their teams through those changes. Um, in general, in these situations, maybe they don't have the ability to push back or question why these changes are being made. They are just strictly the messenger. Um, and on the other hand, you have the shooter who gets really, really frustrated with the messenger telling them how to do things or what direction to go without being able to actually give their input or be part of the conversation. Um, they feel worked at um, instead of worked with. And uh, many times, especially in technical roles, when you have a lot of experience and you sort of, you know, this isn't your first rodeo, you've done this before and you maybe have some really good feedback, it's frustrating to feel like no one cares. Um, this is just the way that we're going. So they feel micromanaged and the messenger feels trapped because they're sort of in this sandwich between execs and the people that they're managing and can't really, and don't feel empowered to actually make those decisions or push back one way or the other. Uh, and big surprise, um, neither one of them have sympathy for each other. Uh, sometimes the messenger maybe feels a little bit of sympathy because they sort of feel like my hands are tied, uh, but the shooter generally won't. Um, they don't feel sympathy for the manager that they feel like should be an advocate for them and maybe isn't being one. Uh, so, taking all of these into consideration, um, the place I keep landing on is collaborating on product delivery requires sympathy for all stakeholders. Um, all of us in this room are stakeholders. Everyone who's contributing to a product, whether it's building it, designing it, um, testing it, supporting it, selling it, everyone is a stakeholder and we have to understand that we are you know, one of those bees in that hive and we have to understand how all the other bees are functioning and how they're all working so that we can collaborate better instead of just being siloed and trying to just focus on our piece of the puzzle instead of the whole picture. Uh, so this sounds really wonderful <laughs> um, and fuzzy and happy, but how do we actually do that? Uh, being in technical roles, we want something concrete. We want a solution. We want steps or instructions on, you know, what can we actually do to cultivate that sympathy among tech teams? So there's three ways um, that I have been looking at and researching on cultivating that sympathy. And the first is to educate. Um, this is it goes both ways. So you're educating yourself and you're also educating other people. Uh, learn about what other people in your company do. Uh, sit down with a salesperson and talk to them about what their day-to-day -day life is. Or, um, you know, talk to marketing. How does marketing run? What tools are they using? Um, what metrics are they trying to, to gather? What pressure maybe do they feel to get their piece of that puzzle complete? Uh, and then educate others on what it is that you do. Uh, being in a t more technical role, I think people in outside departments tend to think that we just do a bunch of magic and that it's not that hard. Um, uh, and it, 
it's very helpful and valuable to explain to people, even on a very high level, what it is you're working on and how complex it is. Um, if there are people in outside departments who are showing interest in something like programming, uh, give them some resources to help them learn or sit down with them for a little bit and work with them on a small, small project. Um, you can also initiate lunch and learns or training meetings. I even had um, a member of our support team come to me a few weeks ago and ask if she could uh, kind of pick my brain for a couple of hours on what our engineering and testing processes are uh, so that she could better understand how to communicate bug, bug fixes to customers. And it was really great because we were able to both sit down and, and in an hour cultivate that sympathy between the two of us. I felt a lot more sympathy for our support team um, and that customer facing role and I think she felt a lot more sympathy toward QA and engineering with uh, you know, the workloads that we have and everything we're trying to get done. Uh, so the second is to define. Um, Many times, especially in that scenario with the thrower and the catcher, um, the sort of core issue there is that roles aren't well-defined and requirements aren't well-defined. And so someone can think that they're completing their job and the next person in line doesn't think that's the case. Um, so working with teams to define process and set expectations. What, what deliverables are needed before something goes from product into build? Um, what documentation is needed before something goes from being built to being tested? Uh, these are all things that need to be very clearly defined so that everyone knows what their role is and what they are being held accountable for. This also, uh, puts everyone in the company in a position where they're empowered to push back. Um, if all of those roles are very well defined, then it's easy to pinpoint when and where the ball got dropped and make sure that that is fixed instead of uh, just snowballing down to the next person. The third is probably the most difficult one, um, and that is compromise. Uh, at the end of the day, we're not all going to get our way all the time. Horrible. Um, but there are times when there are deadlines or unexpected issues come up. Maybe someone quit and they were working on a very important project and it's got to go out the door. Uh, things happen, unfortunately, and, um, and things need to be dealt with and solved quickly. Um, the, the best piece of advice or, or the thing that I've felt works the best in these scenarios is being willing to find a place where you can meet in the middle rather than um, you know, sitting in meetings across from people with your arms folded and no one refusing or um, you know, no one wanting to budge at all. Everyone's just sort of like, nope, this is how it is and, uh, and no one will move. And the problem with that is that um, the, the conclusion from a lot of those meetings is one person wins and one person loses. One person gets their way, the other person sort of like has to just deal with it. Um, and finding ways to meet in the middle and being able to push back just a little and say, you know, that deadline, um, I understand that it's important, but it's also very unrealistic and here's the reasons why. Um, and being able to reach a place where both of you are sympathetic for each other, um, for the work that you have to do, and then you can find a place that, you know, maybe it's not the perfect solution, but it's something that both of you can live with um, and then, uh, as was previously stated, rewarding the work of those who have gone above and beyond. If there is someone on the team or an entire team who's been, you know, having to work extra hours or, um, or, you know, try to get something out the door quicker than was expected, uh, rewarding them and acknowledging that work goes such a long way toward cultivating that sympathy because, the person um, that's giving the acknowledgement um, is sympathizing with the person who's had to work so hard, and that person um, then in turn understands that you know um, the the company cares for them, their their um, coworkers care for them, and have that sympathy for them as well. So these are kind of the three um, 
ways that we can all start sort of cultivating that sympathy across tech teams and even across our entire company. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it becomes very difficult when you feel like you're siloed or not heard or not respected. Um, and these can really help to, to go a long way to solving that and to reaching that goal of we're all in this together. Um, and if we can all uh, understand that and have sympathy for each other, it becomes a lot easier to build out products and to work toward those common goals. Um, so that's all I have. Um, yeah, if anyone has questions, I rushed through it. <laughs> She has about 15 minutes left, so if you guys have questions, let's throw them out there. How do we cultivate responsibility without cultivating blame? I think that's a difficult thing to do, and, and um, it becomes really complex when no one wants to finger point, and no one wants to be called out either. Um, and I think, uh, you know, cultivating responsibility, part of that is making it very clear that these are the expectations, um, that these were the things that were promised that you would deliver, um, and, and being able to, to sit down, go through those things, rather than saying, you really messed up, um, more a conversation about, let's figure out where the lapse was in what was expected and what was delivered, and what still needs to get accomplished. Um, I, I really appreciate, so we have, at our company, we release every, uh, every week, and the next day we have what's called a good, bad, and ugly meeting, um, which is essentially what, what went well and what didn't go so well um, in releases. And there's never any, why did you do that? Why did this not work? Or um, why wasn't this done correctly? It's more, um, okay, this happened. This is why it wasn't good. Uh, what can we do going forward to prevent this from happening again? So it's more looking forward rather than I want somebody to blame or throw under the bus. Okay, very nice. Yeah, another question. How do you see QA's role in dealing with non-functional or operational requirements? How can, how can QA help uh, incentivize uh, developers to do, those, do the work they don't want to do? Right. <laughs> Um, I think uh, one of the things that helps a ton is uh, in making sure that when teams are built out, the QA is part of that development team, um, that we are working with engineers, we're working with product, we're in scoping meetings right from the very beginning, and we can ask questions as far as use cases or edge cases for something goes. Um, and then as the, the product or the, the feature or the bug is being fixed, as, as work is being done, uh, QA is also able to work. We're able to start building out test cases. We're able to write out those edge cases. And I have a developer that I work with who will take those and use those test cases to build out his code. He knows how I'm going to test it, and he knows what the use cases are. And it becomes easier for him to understand and catch those things before they get to QA. Um, and there's a lot more uh, communication around what the expectations are, what the requirements are. A test plan should be created right at the very beginning when something's being scoped out. Um, and I think, again, it's just that, that communication. Everyone's on the same page. Everyone along that line is going to know how QA tests this so we can make sure it's, first of all, being tested um, uh, thoroughly enough, but that the developers understand what the requirements are uh, right from the beginning. So, Okay, I've really favored this half of the room, so I'm going to walk over here. I'm pretty sure there's got to be questions over here. So more questions about how do we navigate with QA? The pressure on this side. Uh, what's the best way to deal with people when they do become like defensive about their code, where it's just kind of in their personality? Um, you know, as as much as you try to set expectations ahead of time and manage that, mm -hmm. like how do you deal with the conflict of people who do get defensive? That's a very good question. I tell people all the time that QA is 30% uh, skill and 70% psychology. You have to understand how to talk to people. Um, 
it, it does become difficult when uh, I think that it's, uh, it's common and it's easy to wrap your ego in your code. This is your baby. This is, um, uh, programming is very creative. Most people wouldn't say that, but it is. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes there are times when um, someone will get really defensive. And uh, I, I spoke to a senior level dev that I worked with uh, a couple of years ago, and he said, he said, I want you to understand that most of the time when an engineer uh, gets upset or irritated with QA, it's because they're upset with themselves because there was something that they should have caught and didn't. Um, if there are issues like that, um, I really try to just sit down and, and talk with people. It's, it's easy right now, especially with all of the technology we have in our offices, like I'll sit next to someone and they're slacking me. And I'm like, what? I'm right here. <laughs> um, I think that face-to-face -face communication can go a long way and, you know, sitting down and just resolving those issues. And then if there was a lapse in communication as far as, um, you know, maybe the engineer understood the requirements very differently than QA understood it. And in that case, that's, that's a bigger conversation where all the stakeholders need to get together and sit down and figure out um, you know, where, the, where the communication dropped and what the solution is going forward. Okay, we have another volunteer. So quick question. Um, as an engineer, QA can be very frustrating as in I put something out there, QA says it's not good enough, it's not to spec, push it back, go back and forth. How have you found success in creating a culture of collaboration versus uh, an environment of dictatorship or having engineers just hate your guts? <laughs> Someone just yelled that this is a qualifier, this is her boss. So he's My emulating. Boss boss. Oh, your boss is boss. He's <laughs> actually the big wig. This is really emulating, I want to point out what Ross Clanton pointed out earlier, which is when that C-suite really emulates safety. That, so this is, you know, big props to you, we won't clap, you probably get lots of that. But go ahead and answer. Uh, so, um, one of, at my previous job, one of the things that I saw frequently was this us versus them mentality when it came to engineers and QA. And I feel like that's really common, it's very typical. Um, and sort of having a little bit of that uh, frustration between the two teams where QA is sort of like, my job is literally to tell you when your code is not working. And uh, it, it becomes really frustrating on both sides. The thing that I have found that has helped me immensely and other QA people immensely is, is that um, education, like understanding how dev process actually works, like getting into the code, uh, learning more, um, like more of the tools that the devs are using, understanding more of that technical aspect so that when I sit down with a dev and I, t I show them something that's not working, it's just not, you know, hey, when I click this button, nothing happens. Um, I'm actually able to say, you know, I tried to do this thing, the network's returning this response, this is what the console's returning, you know, this is the information that's, that's coming through, um, and it helps them to uh, feel like I'm, I'm a detective on their team. I'm helping them figure out what the problem is. I'm not doing that, just hucking it over the fence and being like, doesn't work, you're a problem now. So I feel like that's, that's a huge thing, is just understanding how they work, what information they need, and then if something is broken, uh, I can help explain why instead of just pointing fingers, so. Thank you, we have time for one more question. I'm way in the back, so here we go. So this question goes back to what you spoke about. You know, the project managers in a panicky state, they want something done, and here's a developer, the thrower and the catcher. Who is the person to push the stop button over here to say, okay, I'm going to slow down the process. I know something needs to get shipped out, but I also want QA to go and learn this new tool so they can apply some things in their process, say, assume, like, automate something or, you know, do something better to make the product better. But everyone is in a go, go, go mode. Who is the person to push the stop button and say, okay, we're going to slow down. I'm going to tell sales I'm not going to do this because we need this baked in our product right now? 
That's a good question. I, I feel like um, a lot of us uh, sometimes get in a position where we feel like, um, you know, managers or, or people above us, they're the ones making decisions as far as like when we're going to slow down or what processes we're going to change. And, and we end up feeling like uh, we don't really have any control over that. And one of the things that I've learned is if, you, if you're able to um, not only recognize a problem or an issue as far as, you know, we're going too fast um, and it's causing all of these problems, uh, to be able to actually come up with solutions uh, that you can then take to a manager or an executive and say, hey, I was, I was thinking about this. This is an issue that we keep running into. Here's how I propose that we fix it and the people that we need to talk to in order to kind of get that going. Uh, also, collect data. Uh, if you're wondering about, you know, uh, maybe QA tickets are being rejected at a really, really high rate, like capture that data so that you can present it um, as a way to uh, not only pinpoint where an issue is, uh, but also have a way to measure success as you change process. Um, just make sure that you approach them with a solution rather than like, this isn't working and everybody's unhappy, so. All right, thank you. Huge round of applause for her, right? Totally on the fly questions. Yeah.